Up next on a holiday salute to military families, the inspiring story of how one man's decision to lay wreaths at the graves of fallen soldiers grew into a worldwide day of remembrance. That photograph actually just uh, went around the world and it catapulted this into what it is today. It runs like a well-oiled machine, but this operation does much more than just deliver two million care packages to service members around the world. When you receive on top of that care package, seven to 10 handwritten letters of appreciation from complete strangers, it moves you beyond words. And what would any holiday event be without great food? Italian-American celebrity chef Lydia Bastianich shares a recipe and her appreciation for freedom. Who's gonna throw the pasta in the water? Butta la pasta, as we say in Italian. These stories and some special shout outs from around the world and some familiar faces back home. All up next on a holiday salute to military families. A Holiday Salute to Military Families is presented by National University, a veteran-founded nonprofit offering tuition discounts for active duty service members and dependents. Learn more at nu.edu. By USAA, proudly serving the military community. What you're made of, we're made for. And this program is produced in partnership with DAV, fulfilling our promises to the men and women who serve. Hello and welcome to a holiday salute to military families. I'm Lauren Wonko. For the next hour, we'll bring you stories of giving, gratitude, and service. But we begin where many great holiday events begin, in the kitchen. And since we're going to cook, we asked one of the great chefs of our time to join us. Lydia Bastianich is an Italian-American restaurateur, author, and television host. Her TV series, Lydia's Kitchen, is in its eighth season. Lydia, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, Lauren, a pleasure. Buongiorno. Welcome to my kitchen. Oh, I'm happy to be there. I know from being a fan of your work on television that you have great respect for the military service members and veterans. Why? Indeed, Lauren. You know, I am an immigrant. I came to the United States. I was 12 years old. Lived in Istria, which was part of Italy. Became communist under communist Yugoslavia after World War II. And Eventually, we escaped. My parents decided we couldn't live in communism, escape back into Italy. In Italy, after the war was difficult, we ended up in a refugee camp. We stayed for two years in a refugee camp and awaited for somebody, one of the countries, to accept us and to give us a new life. And so it was in 1958, Dwight Eisenhower was the president, and we got an invitation to become Americans, to come to America. That was exciting. 1958, coming and starting a new life. And Lauren, that's why I really understand what it means to have freedom, to be in a democracy, to be able to practice your own religion, speak your own language. And I am forever grateful to those, to those veterans out there that protect us, that freedom for us. And so whether I'm cooking for them, whether I'm sending them gift, whether I'm sending them a love letter, I just want to show my thank you. You love to talk about food as a connector. Tell us how you bonded with family and friends over a great meal. You know, food is love, food is connection, food is giving, food is nurturing, and it gives you a sense of peace also. Food is peaceful. Uh, and food is positive. It, it gives us energy, it gives us a good feeling. So you put a good meal on the table, you will get them coming. And uh, 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 you know, Cook in Italian for me is what I do, but I use that gift that I was given when I do with veterans, when I do with autistic children and all of that, everybody can relate to food. For you, what's the important thing about gathering around the table? Well, the table is the ultimate, <laughs> I think, you know, the ultimate place where we really connect. You know, why do we have uh, uh, proposals? We set up a dinner to propose a business lunch or dinner because when we eat, we are open and vulnerable and we accept the message that's coming. So the table works for many things. I see you're making an antipasto. I wish I was ah. in your kitchen right now. Tell us, is this something that you often serve for people when you host dinner at your home? 
You know, Lauren, uh, when you do a, 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 a gathering, especially of a lot of people, an antipasto is a great way to begin because, you know, you put a spread out and uh, people come to it so then you as a home chef can continue to do cook whatever you're cooking while they're nibbling on the antipasto. And of course, the antipasto needs a nice affettati, as we say in Italian. So the Italians, of course, have their prosciutto, the dry ham. And of course, the cheeses, a nice piece of grana, a nice provola, a nice pecorino, and then of course the condiments. Uh, and of course, a good glass of wine, and you got the party started. Well, that antipasto looks absolutely delicious. If only we were together, Lydia, in person so I could try it too. But fortunately, there is a family standing by right now. Army veteran Ebony Anwardi and her three sons, Jonathan, Jaden, and Jamari. Hi, guys. Thanks for being with us today. Ebony, tell us a little bit more about your beautiful family. Um, yes, um, I have three boys. They're the love of my life. Um, they're such good kids. I cannot complain. God has blessed me. Tell us a little bit about your service. Well, I joined in the military January 2001, along with my husband, Justin Amorty. Uh, we both were in the Army together, and we were both medics. So we enjoyed our time in the service. Unfortunately, I lost him in Iraq in 2004. We're so sorry. You must carry his memory every day. Yes, ma'am. What do you want people to know about Justin? I want everybody to know that he was a gentle giant. Um, he loved family, he loved food, um, and he loved to serve his country. Ebony, tell me, you know, knowing that your life is on the line, when you committed, when you and your husband committed, what was that passion? What was that need? Why, 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 does, why does a veteran do it? Um, we do it for ourselves, we do it for our families, we do it for our local community. I mean, it's more of a personal thing as far as um, my family. I have relatives, my father, my grandfather, and all those had served before me. So I just felt like I wanted to as well. Ebony, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the dedication that uh, uh, you veterans have done and do for us to keep America free, to keep the, our democracy. Uh, I take every opportunity to thank you guys because you are extraordinary. You are what keeps America what it is, the great country that it is. Lydia, you were nice enough to send along some ingredients. Tell us what family's looking at right now. So Ebony, you know, uh, let me, let me set you in an Italian mode. Okay. So we're gonna make penne baked with marinara sauce. Uh, you get some good marinara sauce, some good pasta, some good cheese, and you toss it and you put it in the oven and you have a nice tray and you can make one or two. And it is especially good recipe when you have a lot of guests coming. So I'm excited to share it with you, Ebony. Lydia, you make it sound so easy. We'll check in with you both later on, but up next on a holiday salute to military families, the inspiring story of how one family's decision to lay wreaths at the graves of fallen soldiers grew into a worldwide day of remembrance. I knew then, I knew Christopher would not be forgotten. Hi, I'm Mike Krzyzewski, coach of the Duke University men's basketball team, and I just want to wish a happy holidays to all our military personnel around the world. Please have a great holiday season. Hi, my name is Jimmy Rollerson with the 146 ESP, and I just want to wish all my friends and family a Merry Christmas. Hi, I'm Sergeant Kendall Roberson from the 146 ESP out of Jacksonville, Florida, and I would like to wish my friends and family a happy holiday. Each year, more than two million wreaths are laid on the graves of fallen service members all across the country. For families who've lost loved ones, National Wreaths Across America Day is personal and healing. I'm Dolly Sullivan, and I am a Gold Star Mother, the proud Gold Star Mother of Captain Christopher James Sullivan, United States Army. 
Well, Christopher was our youngest, our only son. I think he learned to have an appreciation for his country and the need to be ready to defend it. My name is Kevin Haley, and my brother is uh, William Haley, a senior master sergeant of the United States Air Force. I think he felt compelled to, uh, to be a true patriot and join the service. He died April 6th, 1996. He was um, in Iraq from January of 2004. He had just taken command. He was in command 10 days when it happened. He went out with his driver and another soldier. And when they got out of the vehicle and they were walking, they set off an IED. So he was killed by an IED. January 18, 2005. Christopher was interned in Arlington, so we drove ourselves down for 2007. That was our first year. My first time down there, other than the funeral, was that winter of 2002, and it was it was uh, very tough to be there. However, it was beautiful at the same time because you got a sense of uh, great pride, great patriotism, and the people that are surrounded by Reese across America embrace these Gold Star family members like they're their own. A fear any Gold Star parent has is that their child is going to be forgotten. When we saw all the people that came, amazing amounts of people, I knew Christopher would not be forgotten. And that's probably one of the more healing things for us. The Reese represent many things to me. The way I look at it, and when I lay a wreath, it's alive and it's nice to put a living, beautiful thing down on the hollow grounds of Arlington National Cemetery. Oh, lots of hope, lots of hope. You don't decorate the graves, you're going and you're placing that wreath and you say the name of the person. Regina Pearl Mills. And you think about them and you think about what they've done for you. And I guess it's like you realize the love that somebody that didn't even know you gave to you. It's so easy to be discouraged and to um, think that people don't care, but when you're down there and you see that, we know that it's there's far more good people in this country and people that care and appreciate than we see. I know when I go, I'm hoping my kids continue this mission, but a stranger will eventually get to Billy's grave and I'm hoping that they say his name out loud and that he's never forgotten. Morrill and Karen Worcester are the founders of Reads Across America Day. Karen Morrill, thank you so much for joining us and happy holidays to you. Thank, thank you. you. You placed the first wreaths at Arlington National Cemetery in 1992, but you've been in the wreath business for many years now. How did Reads Across America get started? Uh, well, this all started by mistake. I actually bought too many wreaths back in 1992 and didn't know what I was going to do with them. And I thought about uh, where I could put them and uh, uh, thought about Arlington and got permission to place those wreaths. And uh, that's how it all started. From 1992 to 2005, we just went with a few volunteers and 5,000 wreaths. And then in 2005, a Pentagon photographer took a picture of the wreaths against the stones. It was snowing and it went viral on the Internet. That uh, photograph actually just uh, went around the world and it catapulted this uh, into what it is today. How many wreaths are placed each year and where? Last year, it was almost 2.3 million. Um, and it and it, it it grew, you know, over the years. I believe it's 2013. We actually laid out one millionth wreath, and then it's uh, grown at about 30 percent a year. And it used to be one location, uh, Arlington National Cemetery. And would you say uh, tw uh, 2,500? Yeah, I mean, so it, it's grown a, a great deal. We don't try to grow it; it just grows on its own. Try to keep up with know. it. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it important to you to remember our fallen service members? Uh, because, you know, that's, uh, they stepped up for us uh, as, uh, you know, over down through the years, the 244 years that this country has been around, uh, our service people have stepped up uh, for us uh, as, uh, as Americans over and over and over. How has 
COVID-19 affected the event? So we've been making plans as COVID has advanced to make sure that we are going to be able to place the wreaths. The biggest difference is going to be the number of volunteers in the cemetery. But I, I always, uh, when I get thinking about it and worrying about it, um, I remember a Gold Star mother that uh, she used to be on the board. She's since then retired. And she said that for her, what was so special about Wreaths Across America was for the times when she couldn't get to her son's grave and to know Sorry, to know that when she couldn't and when she was gone and she couldn't be there, that Reads Across America and the volunteers would stand at her son's graveside, place a wreath and say his name. So this year, we're going to step up and do that because there are thousands that can't go, but there are thousands that will be all over the country and that will lift up the names of almost two million men and women that serve for those that can't be there. The idea of growing year after year has got to be incredibly moving to you both. We have Gold Star families that go year after year because it heals them. It heals them to know that it mattered. Sorry. I can imagine no matter how many times you do this, the emotion is so raw. Having this evergreen symbol of eternity placed on their loved one's grave and speaking that name ensures them that we will never forget. And more importantly, that we'll teach the next generation. This is what's good about this country. And when you see how divisive things have been over the last year, this is something we all can agree on. During this difficult time when, because of COVID, many of us aren't able to be with our loved ones during the holiday season, what would you like to remind others to think about? Every adversity is an opportunity to teach and to do something better going forward. And that's what I would like people to remember. Think about the people we're honoring because they've got lessons to teach us. Thank you both so much for taking the time to talk to us. We know how busy this time of year is for you too, especially, and we can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Still ahead on our holiday salute, how one woman's rejection by the military channeled her energy into something that brings joy to service members around the world. Thank you to our military families, to our retirees, our veterans. Thank you for the work that you do day in and day out. Thank you for the work that you've done to save this country. I'm just really privileged to just deliver this holiday message of my deep gratitude to each and every one of you that served and support those who served. This program made possible by the generous support of the following companies. Military Made, the first subscription box with products from veteran and military spouse-owned businesses. Do good, get awesome. Visit militarymade.com to learn more. Although 2020 has brought some fears and frustration into our lives, many organizations continue to do good and spread hope. One of them is Operation Gratitude, a group that somehow sends a million care packages to service members and first responders every year. And it all started with a compassionate mother who wanted to do more. I started Operation Gratitude in 2003, but it really goes back to the events of 9-11 in 2001. Um, when that day happened, I'm from New York, I thought my family may have been impacted, and I realized we were a country at war, and I really wanted to serve at that point. Um, I was too old, I was 46 at the time, and I was told by every recruiter, no, sorry ma'am, you're too old. So I decided I needed to find a way as a civilian to show my support for the military. And I just thought to myself at that moment, I know I care and I know Americans care all over this country. And I just realized I had to do something more than just serving hot dogs in a lounge. I needed to really provide something when, when these troops were in harm's way to give them the, the understanding that people at home cared about them, appreciated their service and wanted them to come home. Dear Hero. I address this letter to you as hero because that is exactly what you are to me and the people of this country. You are so inspiring and every day I want to be a better and stronger person because of it. You protect not only the people of America but our wonderful country's past, present and future. I can't thank you enough. Thank you again, Julia.
Operation Gratitude is so dear to our heart because they give back to people who are giving to us. They make our country safe and we're just so grateful for them. This is the first time we participated with Operation Gratitude and it was actually my daughter's idea. She heard about it and wanted to come out and wanted to do something to support the troops and to show our appreciation and our, well, our gratitude for all that they do every day. When I received the care package, it, it really changed my attitude. We were in a really conflicted area of Afghanistan, and, and times were tough. My, my second deployment was really hard. And knowing that somewhere in the world, somebody cared about me and my man, really just changed my perspective, and it added meaning to everything that I was doing overseas. Being here for Operation Gratitude for the first time is so much fun. This is important to me, because my brother was in the Marine Corps for four years, and he loved getting these packages every year. I just like all the service members and, and people out there who have given up their daily lives to be out there working for us, to know how much it is. We really appreciate what it is they're doing out there, and because of what they're doing, we get to enjoy our freedoms here and get to live in such a great place and really have such a great country. And it makes us very proud. We're very proud of them. I know that it's one of the toughest jobs to ever have to serve our country and to sacrifice their time, their life, to just be away. I am so grateful for what you do for me and my family, keeping us safe. I hope that anyone who sees this overseas takes the message of today and sees all of these hundreds and hundreds, probably over a thousand volunteers who've given up their day today because they want to say thank you to you. They want to uh, express their appreciation, their gratitude for all that you and your families are doing for us individually and us as a nation. Joining us now is Kevin Schmiegel, the CEO of Operation Gratitude. Kevin, thanks for joining us and happy holidays to you. Happy holidays to you too. Thanks for having me, Lauren. I'm struck by a picture on your website, Carolyn's living room in 2003. It was packed with supplies and then right next to that is a current photo of a huge warehouse full of items. Do you oftentimes shake your head in disbelief when you think about how much Operation Gratitude has grown? I think this is where the organization has developed a reputation for providing every American the opportunity to express appreciation. And that starts with one person and it grows and grows and grows. And I'm not surprised. I, I think as tomorrow, tomorrow will be my three year anniversary as the CEO of Operation Gratitude. And I have seen simple acts of kindness and gratitude every day. And I have seen the impact that is made on deployed service members around the world and veterans, wounded heroes and caregivers, recruit graduates, military families, and first responders here at home. And we do more than just deliver care packages. We go beyond saying thank you for your service. We make a meaningful connection with uh, civilians, and our men and women in uniform and their families. Usually people receive gifts and packages from people they know. Does the fact that service members are receiving packages from complete strangers move them in a different way? When you're deployed and you receive a hand-knit scarf from a complete stranger, a handmade paracord bracelet, like the one I wear on my wrist every day as a reminder that there are people who do care about the service and the sacrifices I made and my family made. When you receive on top of that care package, seven to 10 handwritten letters of appreciation from complete strangers, it moves you beyond words. And I, I guarantee you of the 20,000 service members deployed in 50 countries and on US naval vessels on all seven seas, thousands of them will be impacted more deeply and more profoundly than our volunteers will ever realize or imagine. Kevin, how has the troop drawdown affected your operation? When the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan slowed down in particular, we were still receiving tens of million items a year. So we decided to use them to fill our care packages and send them to veterans and wounded heroes and caregivers across the country. We also have a program uh, for recruit graduates. We also have this wonderful program for military families. We impact about 20,000 military children a year with our cuddly stuffed bears called Battalion Buddies. 
uh, and our, our most recent program uh, started about three years ago when we expanded out to include first responders. Every police officer and firefighter and EMT across the country uh, is eligible to receive one of our care packages. Has COVID-19 hampered your operations or discouraged volunteers? Imagine if you're a deployed service member whose deployment has just been extended for three months or an unknown period of time, and you're worried about your family, and you're not going to get back to them for months on end. We have to continue in the fight with them. We have to remember that they cannot stop. And if they cannot stop, we will not stop. What makes Operation Gratitude special and unique is that we give our volunteers a sense of purpose. And right now, with COVID and everything that's going on, that sense of purpose is more important than people realize. Thanks for joining us, Kevin, and keep up the great work. Thanks. Take care. When we return, we'll take you back to Lydia's Kitchen, where our celebrity chef shares a special family recipe with our veteran family. USAA would like to join our nation in wishing our veterans and military families a happy holiday season and express gratitude for those who are deployed away from their loved ones during this special time of year. Back to the kitchen where we're joined by celebrity chef Lydia Bastianich and our veteran family in North Carolina at Ebony and Marty's home. Ebony, it looks like you lost a couple of your kitchen helpers there. Everything okay? Oh, yes. I just have my little helper here. He's always helpful with me in the kitchen. The other two, they'll be back just to eat. Lydia, how's Ebony doing so far? I think she's doing fantastic. I specifically like her assistant, Jamari. Great to have him in the kitchen. Now, uh, Ebony, the pasta is cooked, right? How's the sauce doing? I... Oh, it's simmering nicely. <laughs> okay, you're gonna you're gonna use. I think you can use the other jar too. Why don't you put the other one in there too? That's it. And uh, uh, Jamari, why, while mom is adding the, the 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 marinara sauce, do you have basil right there in front of you? Yeah. Okay. Take it in your hand and just. Rip it in the sauce. Go ahead, Jamari, you can do it. That's the basil, that's it. Smell, smell the basil. It has a very, isn't that great? We love it, us Italians love that. So just kind of break it up and throw it in the, in the sauce. Mom is mixing. All right. Okay, mom is all set. Everything is okay? Yes. Okay, so Jamari, in front of you, you have the baking pan. That's where we're gonna put everything. But I would take one ladle or two of sauce and line the bottom of the pan with that. Can you do that? All right. That looks good. We're moving along. Now, uh, um, Ebony, I would put in the sauce, take the ricotta and dump it in the sauce. You're at home, that's how we cook at home. That's it. So now you can take the cooked pasta, I see you have it draining right next to you, and put it in the baking dish. Just pour it in the baking dish, the cooked pasta. It's cooked and drained. So, Jamari, you, it's, you, it's your job to mix the pasta until it gets all coated with the sauce. Mom can help too. Uh, um, Ebony, you can add a, a, a handful of grated cheese, grana cheese, to the pasta. You know, be generous. I like my, my, my cheeses, and kids like cheeses. And slowly add also a, a, a ladle of sauce to the pasta. And Jamari, you keep on mixing. Don't stop. You keep on mixing. Ebony, add, add the sauce to the pasta. That's it. Add some more. At the end, you're going to have to add just about all of it. You leave about two ladles in the back so that we can put it on top. And, and as he's mixing, you add uh, the, the shredded cheese, which is the shredded provola and the sh shredded grana. You add that. And uh, you have a little bit of the mozzarella there too? Yes. Okay. So. As he's mixing, you add a little bit of all those cheeses so it kind of spreads around the pasta. 
always leaving about one fourth of each to top the baked pasta so it has that nice crust that we all love. All right. So, Jamari, what's your favorite food, Jamari? Uh, spaghetti and pasta. Oh, there you go. So, pasta, this is your favorite food. So, Jamari, Ebony, it looks like you're ready to put the pasta in the oven. The oven is hot, right? Uh, you put it in and you leave it in there for about half an hour, depending on your oven. But, Jamari, you are in charge of minding that pasta. Go and check once in a while. And when the top is nice and crispy and crunchy the way you like it, you call mom and you guys get it out of there. You're responsible for the crunchiness and the color of the pasta. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Let's do it. Ebony and Jamari, great job. We're a good team. Thanks guys, we'll check back in with our all-star cooking team at the end of the show to see what comes out of the oven. And Ebony, that's gonna give you time to call the boys back in because it's gonna be time to eat. But coming up, this war hero has broken through many barriers to become one of the most powerful women in Congress. Hi, I'm Jeff Hall, National Employment Director for DAV, Disabled American Veteran. And to all of our service members, veterans and their spouses and families, we thank you for your service and sacrifice and wish you all a very healthy and happy holiday season. Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth is distinguished by a number of firsts. She's the first female disabled veteran elected to Congress, the first female double amputee in the Senate, and the first senator to give birth while holding office. But before being elected, she was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. In 2004, during Operation Iraqi Freedom, her helicopter was hit by a rocket-propelled grenade. She lost both of her legs and part of the use of her right arm. During her recovery, she became an advocate for her fellow soldiers. Senator, thank you for joining us today. It's great to be on. Thanks for having me. Our Holiday Salute program is full of stories about people being of service during the holiday season and throughout the year. Why did you decide to serve your country in the military? You know, I grew up partially overseas and I really understood the privilege of being an American. Uh, my dad um, was uh, an American service member serving overseas and for, in the Vietnam War and he really instilled in us the need to give something back. I never thought I would serve in the military. I thought I would serve in the Peace Corps or the Foreign Service. Um, but I fell in love with the Army and ended up doing 23 years. And I just think it's so important for everything that we have to uh, do something to give back to our community and to our nation. Many veterans have a desire to serve after they leave the military. Did you know that public service was a path you wanted to continue on? No, I did not. I never thought about going into public service. I was working for a not-for-profit, a Rotary International at the time, and I thought, I would just go back to my job at Rotary, but I happened to be the highest ranking amputee at Walter Reed uh, at the time when I was wounded for a while. And I started advocating for my fellow soldiers and, and Marines and airmen who were there with me. Um, and that's when uh, Senator Dick Durbin from Illinois came to me and said, you know, if, if you think we're not doing right by veterans and you need to run for office yourself. And I thought he was crazy, <laughs> but here I am now a, a, a Senator. <laughs> I understand that you're the co-author of the Veterans Small Business Enhancement Act. How does that legislation help veteran entrepreneurs? So that came out as a part of um, my uh, talking to a lot of veterans. Um, and I also had used um, surplus property. You know, the government has all this surplus property. And when I started my congressional office after I was elected, they gave me this very glossy catalog and said, here, go buy new, new office furniture. And by the way, your new desk can cost $10,000. And I thought, oh my God, this is taxpayer dollars. What are we doing? And I said, isn't there somewhere I can get some used furniture? Like, what about the guy who had this job before me? Can I get his old furniture? And I said, well, yeah, if you want to do that, there's a warehouse and there's these warehouses all across the country where you can go where there's all this federal surplus property. And you're in the military, you know this, it's called the Dermo. And right now, um, governments uh, like, towns and municipalities can go and get surplus property there. So I said, well, 
let's add a clause to the rule and say that if you are a veteran owned small business, you can go there and get government surplus property for free. So what is the impact of the bill on the overall American economy? Well, it's going to help grow the economy because veterans will be able to successfully start their, their businesses. More veterans will actually be able to start a business and keep that business. And we know that when veterans um, run or own a business, they tend to hire other veterans. And so that actually helps to expand our economy. And it also helps veterans find jobs. And it also helps to prevent veterans homelessness because the largest predictor of veterans homelessness is actually whether or not you can find a job. You've broken a lot of barriers during your time in politics. You've led such an inspiring life. What do you hope others take away from your personal story? Well, I wasn't trying to break barriers. <laughs> Trust me, I wasn't trying to become an amputee, for example, or become disabled. I Listen, I, I hope what people get from uh, hearing my story um, is the idea that it's okay to fall down and it's okay to have setbacks. Um, the key is just to keep trying. You know, when I lost my legs uh, after the insurgent attack, um, I could have just gone home and, and, and you know, lived my life quietly, but because I felt very passionately that we weren't doing enough by veterans, um, I was able to use that as a soapbox to stand on and, and, and to fight for um, uh, veterans' rights, veterans' causes. And that led to a new, whole new world, world of service. So what I would say to folks is go where your heart leads you and you know, pour your heart and soul into it. And you never know which new doors will open, but don't let a setback stop you. Senator, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to see you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And stay with us. Ebony's pasta dish is about to come out of the oven. We'll see how it turned out. We're back with celebrity chef Lydia Bastianich and Army veteran Ebony Unwardy and her sons. They just made one of Lydia's recipes and we can't wait any longer. Guys, how did it turn out? Great. It's ready. It's, are you ready to dig in? Yes. All right. That looks, looks pretty good from here. Jamari, are you happy with it? Does it look good? Yes. All right. Are you excited about eating it? Yes. That's, that's right, Ebony. He gets the first serving and the best part. Whatever he wants, he gets. He helped, right? right. All right. And the other guys are kind of waiting patiently. But uh, Ebony, you seem to be very comfortable in the kitchen, you know, and cooking. Where did your passion for cooking come from? You know, evidently you do a lot of cooking. Um, my first experience that I remember was, came from my grandmother. She used to cook for a Catholic priest back home. And she would, on the weekend, she would take me and we would be at the soup kitchen. It's one of the first places I remember cooking. So, so you, your humanitarian kind of, uh, uh, shall we say, trend or root in the family goes back to grandma. You were all conscious about uh, helping other people. That's wonderful. Guys, you know, you know what I say at the end of my show when I, I put the food on the table? I say, tutti a tavola a mangiare. Do you know what that means? In Italian, but in English it means everybody to the table and let's eat. I see them stretching out the plate. Jonathan, are you looking forward to this? Uh, looks interesting. What do you mean looks interesting? You're supposed to say it looks delicious. It is. Look at all the cheese oozing. He, a teenager, a skeptical teenager. Uh, Ebony, this is a good dish. Take, take a taste. Take a taste. I want to know what you think about it. Huh? I, you know, I always taste on my show because people love to see how everything. Really good. This is pretty good. Good, guys? Everybody? Lydia, where's my dish? I'm so jealous. <laughs> Laura, you're going to have to do some baking yourself. <laughs> Lydia, it must make you feel so good to see other people enjoying your food. It is. It's a pleasure. It's a way of giving. And you know, in these times, especially uh, when there's a lot of uh, people that don't have enough food on their table, uh, it's all the more reason to be thankful, to be thankful for the food we have, and to be thankful, thankful for people like Ebony and the veterans, that they keep us safe. Ebony, 
I have something for you that I want to give you from my home to yours, and that is a few cookbooks for you and the boys. I see you love to cook. I want you to get more into the Italian cooking, and I want to be part of your household, of your family, even if only with the aromas for now. Thank you so much, Lydia. That was awesome of you. I enjoyed really, um, I enjoyed making your recipe. I would look forward to making many more. Okay. Ebony, you got one-on-one -on -one instruction today and a great gift. It's a good deal. Thank you both so much for joining us today. We'll be back with a final word right after this. Thanks for watching a holiday salute to military families. If you'd like to find any of the stories on our show or share them with friends and family, visit HolidaySalute.com. I'm Lauren Wonko. Happy holidays and remember, stay safe and take care of one another. A Holiday Salute to Military Families is presented by National University, a veteran-founded nonprofit offering tuition discounts for active duty service members and dependents. Learn more at nu.edu. By USAA, proudly serving the military community. What you're made of, we're made for. And this program is produced in partnership with DAV, fulfilling our promises to the men and women who served. This program made possible by the generous support of the following companies. Military Made, the first subscription box with products from veteran and military spouse-owned businesses. Do good, get awesome. Visit militarymade.com to learn more. Promotional consideration provided by JetBlue, a proud employer of those who served. From our entire team. From the Worcester family and the Reeds Across America family. God bless you. Enjoy the holidays. Have a happy and joyous holiday season. And a happy new year. Be safe.